Hey everyone, Mark Bacom here again, and welcome to another overview video using the Future 8 Ball Development Board and the PIC16 F18446. I'm going to edit the demo software for the Future 8 Ball to demonstrate how you can actually take advantage of the on-chip features of the PIC16 F18446 microcontroller, populating the Curiosity Nano Development Board integrated onto the 8 Ball baseboard to optimize our application. So the Future 8 Ball default demo uses this push button on the board to scroll through different modes that do various things on the board. When you press the button, you should note that the LED lights and the menu on the OLED changes. You may also notice that if you press the button too fast, that the menu and LED won't change with every press. So why is this? Let's see what's going on. Opening the main.c source file, you can see there's a bunch of code here, much of it using the push button press as a trigger to step through a state machine with each state representing one of the future 8-ball modes. I summarized all of this into a very basic flowchart to hopefully make this easier to follow. The button on the Curiosity Nano is a mechanical switch, and mechanical switches are prone to switch bounce when the contacts connect and disconnect multiple times following a switch press or even a release, and these could be perceived as multiple presses and releases when the user only pressed the button once. To overcome this, a switch debounce routine is commonly used to filter out unwanted press detections. Here's how switch bounce is handled in the code on the Future 8-Ball. There are a couple of defined entities in this project. First of all, we have the button action timing constant, which is defined as 3, and a button get value macro, which essentially reads the pin voltage on the RC2 pin on the PIC16 F18446. The RC2 pin on the Curiosity Nano is connected to the push button. Here is a screen capture of the Curiosity Nano schematic showing the push button connection. Again, as I mentioned in a previous video, the schematic is readily available through the links in the kit window of MPLabX. One end of the user push button is connected directly to the RC2 pin through a current limiting resistor and the other end connected to ground. So when the switch is pressed, the voltage on RC2 will be driven to ground or logic low or zero. The flowchart over here is a basic representation of the code that the CPU executes in the while one loop. First thing that happens is that the RC2 pin level is checked using the button get value macro. If that value is 1 or logic high, the button is considered not pressed and a variable called button press timer is cleared along with a get button variable and the LED is turned off. A 40 millisecond delay is implemented before returning to the top of the while loop and the process repeats. If the value on RC2 is 0 or logic low, the button is considered pressed and the button press timer variable is incremented. In the next check, the button press timer is checked against our defined button action timing, which is 3. If the button press timer value is greater than 3 and the get button value is 0, then a valid user button press is determined and a state machine, which controls, among other things, the menu and associated modes on the future 8-ball, moves to the next state and the LED is lit. The get button flag is set to high, or logic 1. The 40 millisecond delay is implemented and the CPU jumps back to the top of the while loop and everything is repeated. Now, this is a common method to do switch debounce in software and it's quite effective. However, there are times when push button presses are going to get missed. So if you take a look here, this if statement is the only time that the RC2 pin is checked. And this means that if we press the button when the CPU is doing anything else on this flowchart, remember the CPU can only do one thing at a time, then our button press is going to get missed. Because we're using an 8-bit device for microchip, there are some alternatives using integrated features on the PIC16 F18446, which will not only make the application more responsive to button presses, but can actually reduce the amount of code that you need to write. Most newer 8-bit PIC devices, including the PIC16 F18446, feature a Timer 2 peripheral with an added Hardware Limit Timer, or HLT, feature. Now, most basic timers usually feature a connection to some sort of clock source and then a scaling that will allow the timer to increment a count value every so many input clock cycles. The hardware limit timer capability actually expands on these features by adding an additional input which can use on-chip signals like events from other timers or software or other features integrated onto the PIC device to actually start, stop, or even reset the timer. Off-chip signals can also be used including the pin voltage generated by the user button on the Curiosity Nano. How this is going to work is that the developer would configure timer 2 with HLT with a predefined value and trigger an interrupt when the timer reaches that value. 
To start the timer, the RC2 pin signal is used and the timer is configured to start on the falling edge of the pin signal. So when someone presses the button, the timer starts counting to the predefined value, which has been set to a period that will give the button plenty of time to stop bouncing. Once that predefined value is hit, an interrupt is triggered, notifying the CPU of a valid button press. No need for additional code to take care of counts through loops or flags, etc. So let's go back into MPLAB X with our Open Future 8-Ball project. We'll click on the MCC icon at the top of the IDE to open the MPLAB code configurator. Inside of the MCC interface, navigate to the Device Resources section here. Scroll through the available peripherals for the PIC16F18446 until you locate the timers. Expand Timer and add an instance of Timer2 to the project by double-clicking on it. We are going to configure Timer2 as follows. Monostable mode will be used, which means that a pulse will be generated after our defined amount of time, and this pulse is what's going to be used to trigger our interrupt. To start the timer using our button signal, we will configure the timer to use the Timer2 external source input pin. Since the button drives the RC2 pin voltage low, we're going to want to start timer 2 on the falling edge of the RC2 pin signal. We have a selection of clock sources that we can use. I'm going to use the low frequency internal oscillator. You can see that there is a field down here called timer period. Note that as you change the oscillator, you'll effectively change the minimum and maximum timer periods that you can use. I found that 10 milliseconds is a pretty good time to wait for this particular button to stop bouncing, but my maximum timer period is 8.25 milliseconds. So what I'm going to do is adjust the prescaler to one to two, or increment the timer count every other input clock cycle, changing the maximum possible timer period to 16.5 milliseconds, and now I can enter my 10 milliseconds directly. Note that MCC will actually let you know what the actual timer period value will be that the hardware can accommodate to get as close to your desired value as possible. Next, we want to generate an interrupt when the 10 milliseconds is over, so we'll enable that here. Now, we configured timer 2 to use an external signal on a pin to start the counting. However, we haven't told it which pin to use. There are default settings, but that's not the pin connected to our push button. So if we go down to the pin manager, we'll tie the RC2 pin that's connected to our push button to the input of the timer 2 by clicking on the associated pin here. Okay, we're all set up. Let's go ahead and generate the code. Now, if you take a look at the project source files and header files, you'll see a timer2.h file and an associated timer2.c file. When you open up the timer2.c file, you should see an area at the bottom of the code where you would add your interrupt routine. So whenever that 10 milliseconds we defined is reached, this code here will be executed. Now, we could get pretty elaborate and uh, optimize this application a lot more uh, using this interrupt, but for the sake of demonstration, I'm going to keep this pretty simple and basic. So if you look at our flowchart, you'll see that we've actually changed the flowchart and gotten rid of a bit of code. When the button is pressed, an interrupt will be generated after 10 milliseconds, our debounce time, and then we'll have a button pressed variable that will be set high. The CPU will be going about its business doing other things until it comes time to now check the button pressed variable, which will indicate that the button was indeed pressed while the CPU was busy. Also notice that the defined button action timing and button get value macros are no longer needed. So let's implement this in code. Going back to our code inside of MPLAB X, we'll create an integer variable called button pressed, which is a flag, and we'll initialize it to zero. Inside of our interrupt service routine in timer2.c, we'll set the button press flag high since we've been interrupted by a debounced button press. Going into our main.c, we want to use that button press flag from the timer2.c file, so we need to initialize it here as an extern. So when the flag is changed inside of timer2.c, we'll now be able to see that from within main.c. We can now get rid of the first if statement here, making sure we get rid of both curly braces. In the second if, we can change this line to just check the button pressed flag. Finally, we'll reset the button press flag by clearing it to zero so that other button presses will be detected. And that's it. Program the Curiosity Nano. Once programmed, you should notice that the LED and menu on the Future 8 Ball are a lot more responsive to button presses. This is the power of using peripherals for low-level tasks. 8-bit PIC and AVR microcontrollers from Microchip really focus on high levels of peripheral integration so that tasks such as these and many, many more can be done in hardware rather than using software in the central processing unit.
I would highly encourage viewers to check out a great app note which actually implements a couple even more robust switch debounce routines called Robust Debouncing with Core Independent Peripherals. To find this app note, you can either search for it on the microchip homepage uh, using the app note number AN2805 or using your favorite search engine. For more application examples related to the future 8-ball board, please visit the links on your screen. My name is Mark McComb. Thanks for watching.